Welcome to the fourth lecture of the IOC and uh, Faculty of Science seminar series. And today's lecture is on how local communities in the Maldives value coral reef resources. And I'm very happy to introduce my very close friend uh, and ex-colleague, Dr. Mizna. Uh, she has contributed to this uh, to the environmental sector for 14 years. And her postgraduate research focused on valuing coral reefs of the Maldives. So without further delay, I would like to call Dr. Mizna to deliver her speech. Yes, Shadla. Good morning, and I'm very happy to see the numbers. It's more than I expected. So thank you for coming. And as Shadla said, uh, I've been working, um, doing mainly research on how local, not, not just local communities, but valuing uh, coral reefs and reef resources. And uh, this talk is mainly based on a work, a qualitative work I have done for my PhD research, which is focusing on uh, communities and their uh, perceptions and interpretations of value. And uh, before going on, I think it's uh, important to talk a little bit about why I wanted to answer this question. Uh, what led me to uh, do this survey? Initially, I mean, it's a little story, but a story about myself as well. Uh, I've been initially trained as a physical oceanographer and meteorologist, so I'm a physical geographer. And uh, from this uh, 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 studying about the physical environment, coming to such social uh, work involving social science is a big change, and it wasn't uh, a sudden change, but a gradual change, uh, which, uh, which came to why I was interested in how reefs were valued. Finished my undergraduate degree, I started in the Environment Ministry, and many of the work I did uh, involved uh, looking at environmental management, environmental policy making. So these are some of the work I was involved in looking at EIA approvals, uh, doing erosion studies, talking to communities how to better manage uh, the environment, look after their waste, and things like that. In addition. Ministry was also doing a lot of work on conservation, uh, biodiversity conservation, uh, uh, which result, resulted in a lot of uh, bird species and other um, uh, species being protected in addition to establishment of many protected areas. And while working, I realized that many of the work we did in the ministry was on paper. And it wasn't, uh, we, we used to write in uh, reports we produced nationally as well as to international uh, arena, like the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, biodiversity conservation. In our reports, we used to write, uh, this was back in 2005, 2004, that we had 25 marine protected areas. But uh, this is only on paper, and this was something that was starting to bother me but because we didn't have any management plans. We just said it on paper and showed it to the world how much we were taking care of the environment, whereas in, at the local level, things weren't happening. And uh, seeing, uh, observing that it's only economic incentives that drive action, especially at the policy level, I was wondering if if I could show that there's value in actually conserving biodiversity, that you can get economic benefit, uh, then would policymakers be more interested to go beyond the paper and start actually doing some work on the ground? And this led to my very first work for my master's, which is an economic valuation of coral reefs. I looked at uh, Digaliha, which is a marine protected area in Bayatol, and I compared the uh, cost of actually implementing a management plan with the benefits that can be obtained uh, by con conserving the, uh, pro the, actually managing the protected area. And the benefits I uh, obtained using a willingness to pay off tourists to actually 
uh, if to see this management plan in action. So this was a quantitative work and focused on uh, how outsiders, tourists coming to visit Maldives valued. And it is through this process that I realized that it's very important to actually understand and uh, include how local communities value the reef resources. What do they think about it? It's during these con the management plans. Uh, I was actually, I developed a management plan during this work uh, uh, to improve the management of the Galiha. Uh, this was based on books I read, uh, uh, examples from other countries as well as some little knowledge I had of uh, uh, working with the communities, but it was very minimal knowledge, and this was to develop a management plan, which I, a person who hasn't even gone to the Galiha, had developed. And I went to the communities to discuss this management plan, and the fishermen, they keep asking me, why, do we, why should we play a role in, uh, in the management this is not for us. It's been done for the tourists. It's for their benefit that this place has been protected. And, uh, and this question stayed with me for a long time, even after this. And then the finally, I went to, I found it very important that uh, we should actually be, uh, when we make our policy making decisions, management plans in our offices and boardrooms. We need to be actually going to the communities, finding out why, you know, what is important to them, what aspects are important to them. And I realized that I'm, I'm making decisions, I'm helping making these decisions while as an outsider. So that led to my very big change to uh, social science research, mostly qualitative research. And that's how I started questioning about how do communities value there. And my first big obstacle was how do I measure reef value? I can't just go and ask someone how much do you value? Is it 20 rufia, 200, 2000? Can they answer my question? I don't think it's actually something we really think about. So this was uh, not going to be such an easy task. Uh, for the reason that value is subjective. Now, if I give an example of uh, the value of an automobile, let's say a car, if you look at one view of value, you can say the value of the car is how much the firm has put into producing it, using for the raw materials, the laborers. So in that, that, that is the value of the car. But if you look at another view, if there's no demand for the car, people don't like its design, maybe they don't want to buy the car, then the production has actually no value. So in this aspect, uh, value uh, is not just about the price, but it's about perceptions as well. And uh, this is how O'Neill, Holland and Light uh, identified uh, Value, well, he actually starts out saying there's no such thing as values. And this is a really difficult thing. I was struggling to define value because I need, my whole thesis was about value and I wanted to find one single definition, which is really hard to find. So this was the best one which I found which suited the purpose of my study, that value is something that reflects the various ways in which individuals process and place matter our various modes relating to them and the various considerations that into our deliberations about action. And the very important thing I want to highlight here is uh, the point that the value and relation to action, that's the key thing I wanted to take out when I, in my measurement of value, how do I actually value, uh, measure value? That it's actions which uh, our actions represent how we value things. It's maybe conscious, maybe unconscious, but ultimately it's the, our values are projected in our behavior and actions. And this is um, uh, the roots of many value theories and behavior theories. 
So again, in all values are human constructs. This is the very base of my research, uh, how I define that it's so this, that's why I used a qualitative approach, which is uh, mainly focusing on social constructivism, so that each per individual produces their own uh, constructs about value. And in this uh, definition, I acknowledge that values are pluralistic, that there are many values. Uh, a single uh, object can have multiple values, depending on who is valuing it. Uh, for example, fish, you can sell it at a price, but when you give it to an, your family, of, like, like the fishermen will give it to their family for free. There's another social value bonds, which are uh, created. Uh, and uh, in my examples, I will be showing further how values are pluralistic. And another thing I uh, decided uh, for my research, or I believed, was that uh, value cannot be quantified. It cannot be reduced to a dollar value. If by reducing to a dollar value, for me, that is showing that humans, we are sort of uh, not part of the environment. We, we are stepping outside and we interact and benefit from the environment, but we do not include ourselves in the environment. Uh, in defining the word environment. And this is something I highlighted in my thesis, that we need to broaden our definition of environment. It just doesn't mean the natural environment only. We should be including uh, uh, the people inside the uh, environment as well. And just a little example, this is the logo which is used in the Biotol Biosphere Reserve. Now, if you look at it, this is very much a natural environment. We're talking about conservation, and it's the, it's the fish, the island, the birds, the sky, the sea, the sand, but the trees. But there's nothing that, to me, represents there's any human beings living there. Perhaps a boat, a fishing boat, which will not uh, distort the, uh, like it will not stand out or distort the nice design, but. Just a fishing boat uh, can indicate that there is people living there. They're using these uh, resources for uh, their benefit. So uh, these human nature interactions, if we reduce it to a dollar value for me, that is we are not being part of this. We are not inhabitants. Like It's like watching in the television. You're watching something and you're not actually inside there. But this needs to be changed, this approach. We need to be thinking more of us as part of the environment. And uh, in this uh, uh, construction of values, it's not just the human nature interactions that's important, but the human social, how we interact with other social uh, actors in the community. So for the, uh, taking this into consideration, uh, sorry, before that, mm -hmm. uh, this is finally how I decided to define my value in this research. It's not just about the economic, but I would be including the economic, social, ecological, and cultural, all these aspects into how I interpret value. And in that sense, I think this is actually, we should not be asking this question about res in, in environmental valuation, what is the value of an environment or its resource. Uh, we should, on the other hand, be asking how does the community value their natural resources, linking, not taking the environment or nature in isolation, but linking it with the people. And uh, this is, so uh, the story is gone a bit longer, but this is uh, while incorporating the definitions, this is how I came to uh, answer this question. So why? Am I, why, how do communities value their resources? And so the, uh, th that could be whether it's uh, sorry, uh, the mm, and their valuation might be dependent on how they interact for livelihood, how they enjoy it for nature, the social bonds that are created while they use this, or even just the uh, value of uh, pre protecting it for future use. Uh, all these are ways that p 
people uh, value their reef resources. And as I said at the beginning, I used a qualitative approach because we simply cannot ask how much you, do you value the reef. Do you, it's difficult. I don't think how many of you can actually answer that question. How much would you, do you consider would be a value for you personally? Anybody? I think it's, it's a very difficult question which I can't answer. And uh, I don't think many people would be even thinking about this. So in this, uh, I used value interpretations, the social, cultural, economic, and ecological. Uh, the, so as I had said before, uh, value theories project that our values are projected in our behavior. So f in terms of this question about reef value, I was going to be, I, was, I looked at how the communities uh, interacted with their reef resources, how they used it, and how did they manage it. These were the things I was observing, and my area, these were the, my areas of inquiry. So how did people access the resources? How did they use it? What's uh, changing about resource availability? Is it still the same? What's changing? Why is it changing? How do they consume and distribute it in the community? Uh, what is the local knowledge? I ask questions about local knowledge, the property rights, how, what can be used, what cannot be used, where can people go uh, to, uh, and where, what resources people cannot access. In addition, I looked at local and state rules. And here, state rules, I use the general term state rules to mean any uh, uh, law, guidelines, uh, act that is formed by the national government and the local rules I took there were two kinds of local rules one which are informal it's unspoken rules that is by behavior everybody does there's nothing formally agreed by in a community but there's the more formal local rule as well which is uh, the community actually talks about an issue when there is an issue that arises, they will talk in the community the, in trade, before the Maldive Islands had an island development committee, which is now more or less replaced by the island council, but these uh, island development committees discussed uh, what needs to be done. Say, for example, people were using nets to collect fish. And by using this method, they were taking a lot, uh, a lot faster, they were depleting the uh, fish. So in these instances, the community, uh, the Island Development Committee will talk and decide and say, uh, we will not use nets. Or if there is too, too small, f the size of the fish are small, they will wait until a few months to actually for people to start catching it. So these kind of things, which are a little bit small, but not at the state level, it's not uh, a, a, uh, applied in to the country as a whole. So these were my areas of inquiry. I asked people questions, I observed, and then I uh, tried to interpret value through these areas. <clears throat>